This episode of Military Aviation History was sponsored by the Royal Air Force in collaboration with the Battle of Britain Bunker and Bentley Priory Museum. When we think of the Battle of Britain, we think of this, don't we? Spitfires, Hurricanes, Messerschmitts and Heinkels. And we think about how across the channel a large battle-hardened air force was about to descend upon Britain. We think of the AA gunners, we think about the daily victory score, radar and that cataclysmic battle in the skies. We also think about the pilots, the few who were made famous in that speech by Winston Churchill. What we don't talk about is what made that victory possible. And this is why I've come to Bentley Priory to show you how the Battle of Britain was truly won. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck with coming at you with a very special episode. Bentley Priory was Fighter Command's HQ from 1946 onwards and it's from here that the RAF directed its defensive effort during the Battle of Britain. And it was here that Britain devised a weapon that was so much more potent than even a Spitfire or a Hurricane. I'm of course talking about air operations, the downing system and the personnel that operated it. The few were on the front lines defending the skies of Britain, but behind them were the many. The intelligence officers, the radar and radio operators, the WAF and the plotters and so many more. Here at Bentley Priory in the filter room between 1947 and 1940, Britain developed the first air operation system of its kind. And it was an elaborate and intricate platform that allowed Britain not just to manage the Battle of Britain, but to win it. Based on the early experiments gained in air defense during the Great War and after the experimentation in the filter room, it was time to step up the game. For this, a new bunker was constructed here at Bentley Priory in early 1940. And for this, 58,000 tons of earth was moved and 17,000 tons of concrete put in its place, moving air operations into a protective shell away from enemy bombs. This bunker was then later on upgraded during the Cold War, but that's another story. Now Bentley Priory became the hub of fighter command and it was here that you could get an overview of the daily situation group by group, sector by sector. However, because fighter command was staggered into three tiers, that is command here at Bentley Priory and then group and sector, it wasn't the only air operations room. Indeed, the air operations rooms in the groups and the sectors were actually far more involved in the day-to-day -day running. So that's where we're going right now. Welcome to the Battle of Britain bunker here in Oxbridge, London. It is here where number 11 group orchestrated their defense during the Battle of Britain. Come with me. Over there, we've got a Hurricane. There, Supermarine Spitfired. Of course, both powered by the powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. And they were piloted by some really brave men. Brits, Scots, Frenchmen, Czechs, Poles and the like. And of course, while they swung themselves against the Luftwaffe, they had to be told from people here on the ground as to where to go. And it is here that the historical significance of air operation comes into play. It's also known as the Dowding system, after Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding. It was developed after the RAF realized that a centralized system was required not only to pool and share information relevant to Britain's defense, but also to develop a unified command structure. Everything that was relevant to uh, the responding to an incoming attack came together here in order to coordinate and execute an, an effective response. Included were amongst others the different groups and fighter squadrons to the AA, which even though it was nominally under the command of the home front was acting here with the uh, air ops from the RAF. The observer corps of course on the coastline and the chain home ro radar system and even the meteorological service. And as you might expect all this information had to be taken in, evaluated, filtered as they say and then sent off to the appropriate stations. And all of this created a real intricate system based on some really simple procedures. And you know what? I'll show you guys just how it worked. Come with me. In 
integrated air defense became the heart of any aerial action. Here in the operations room, the men and women of the RF ensured that the fighters appeared at the right place, at the right time, at the right altitude. Everything in this room has a purpose and is designed to be read at a moment's notice. For example, imagine an enemy formation was spotted by Britain's chain home RDF system. This information would be sent directly to Bentley Priory, the place we've just visited before, and there it would be evaluated and then sent to operations rooms just like this one. That usually would not take longer than five minutes. This information would also be sent to the Observer Corps as it was their job to track the intruders once they were over land. The observers, trained volunteers in aircraft recognition, were a decisive element in air ops. They would provide critical information, specifically sudden course changes and the compositions and strength of the incoming raid. Rough estimates of 20 plus, 50 plus and 100 plus sufficed. Back to the operations room. Chain home was rather limited in that regard and unable to do this. With all this information, the relevant squadrons could then be scrambled and sent to the appropriate locations. Sound simple? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. First of all, it was very rare that the Luftwaffe would only send up one group. Usually there were multiple coming in at different headings and all of this information obviously had to be evaluated. Some of these attacks were nothing but ruses. And when the evaluation process was taking place, you didn't also want to accidentally mix something up before sending out the information to the squadrons. So the RAF had to make a calculated judgment call every time information came in in figuring what the Germans were up to at any given point in time. Again, to give you an example, one of the things the Luftwaffe liked to do was to make dummy attacks just prior to a major raid. This was usually done by BF 109s coming in at slow speeds over the channel to fool the radar operator into thinking that bombers were inbound. Squadrons were scrambled before the observers could pitch in and suddenly the fighters expecting slow and vulnerable Heinkels find themselves bounced by angry Messerschmitts. As the pilots returned to rearm and refuel, the door was left wide open for the actual second wave of Luftwaffe planes, the bombers. With time, the RF learned and adapted, and the ground staff got so good at filtering all this information and waiting for the right moment, that by the end of the Battle of Britain, they were well able to differentiate the fake raids from the real ones, and the Luftwaffe was getting really annoyed at that. Even by mid-1940s, the filtering system continued to have occasional hiccups, although the situation did improve greatly from June onwards, when specially trained officers were employed as filterers. They were also later backed up by members of the WAF. Now, let's get practical and show you what would happen in case of a Luftwaffe air raid. First up, the tote board at the back of the room. Essentially an electronic switchboard. Uh, you've got all the information that you need and you also have the time. This is actually a very interesting clock. We'll get to back to that a little later. Uh, for the squadrons, you have the different sectors and of course the squadron numbers. You've got information panels lighting up showing what state the squadrons are in, if they've been ordered to readiness or on standby or in position or indeed on the way home. In one quick glance, everyone in this room could just look up and see what the general state was, what squadrons were engaged and so on. Below all that, you've got these little markers showing the cloud cover in each sector, barrage balloons and of course visibility as well. Then over there where the people are receiving weapon reports, you had the dais housing the group controller, liaison officers and the like. Air Vice Marshal Keith Park was the commanding officer of 11th Group, but he only visited the bunker a few times. However, it is recreated today in the way it was on the 15th of September when Winston Churchill visited. Lastly, the Grand Jewel, General Situation Map or GSM. Just like with the toad board behind me, this map gives you all the information you need at a moment's notice. And it was generally staffed by members of the WAF as plotters, and they wielded two of the deadliest small arms of the whole battle, a radio set and this, a croupier staff. This is actually an original. Through the radio, they were constantly updated on the disposition of Luftwaffe and uh, RAF squadrons, and with their staff, they could update the map within seconds. And to do that, they were given a specific track and used this, a marker. It is extremely simple to read a marker. The rectangle on top shows the squadron number, the blue number shows how many thousands of feet in altitude the aircrafts were and the red number shows how many aircraft were in the flight. Each of the Luftwaffe markers would have a code identifying the formation as well as the strength of the formation set below that. Oh yes, about that clock. You see the different color markings here. Those aren't some kind of artistic design to give this place some color, uh, but they're actually fully functional and the map markers on the GSM are actually tied to these colors right here. So if a plotter got a new report, say hostile 30 plus high 12,000 feet, they'd look at the traffic light at the edge of the map, see one of those three colors also on the clock, say blue, and they would just use the same color with any new marker or tracker. 
They do this for as long as the minute arm remains in the blue segment and then they switch over to the next color, say red in this instance, and then yellow after that. However, once a new color segment was reached, the subsequent color and all the markers with that color would be removed from the map. This means that at no time the map was older than 10 minutes, reducing clutter and confusion. All of this might sound simple, and yes, on paper it is, but don't get the wrong impression. What the RAF was doing here was uncharted territory. No one had a system of integrated air defense quite like this one in 1940, and the impact of this system and the air operation personnel that worked here cannot be understated. Indeed, the Luftwaffe throughout the Battle of Britain never really understood what sort of system they were up against. They fully expected the RAF to suffer from a complete and utter organizational collapse when the opposite was the case. With every day, RAF Air Ops and the men and women working here got better at their job. And they were specialists, without whom nothing like an organized defense of Britain could have been achieved. Just imagine the dire consequences or confusion if one of the plotters managing this GSM might have made a mistake with the map, just giving a false impression of the RAF and the Luftwaffe strength in one area. Or if someone with the switchboard here uh, confused the readiness state of one of the squadrons with that of another one. Or what happens if one of the observers got the strength and the altitude of the incoming radars wrong? Or indeed if the chaps over at the chain home uh, radar forgot to send that one crucial piece of information. And standing here, I am baffled by the simplicity of this system. In front of me is essentially nothing more than a glorified chessboard. Behind me is nothing but a basic electronic panel. Over here are plotters chatting on the radio with somebody operating and not always as accurate as it could be a radar system. And in the coastline, you have a few men with binoculars. And all of this comes together here in air operations. And it knocks out the Luftwaffe. It's genius. All the ascendancy of the hurricanes and spitfires would have been fruitless, but for this system, which had been devised and built before the war, had been shaped and refined in constant action and all was now fused together into the most elaborate instrument of war, the like of which existed nowhere in the world. That's Winston Churchill on Air Ops for you. If you are interested in learning how modern air operation works, check out the annotated video. Thank you very much for taking this tour with us. And I want to thank the Royal Air Force, Bentley Priory, and the Battle of Britain Bunker for making this video possible. As always, share it far and wide, and have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.